Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the 2016 Academic Hooding Ceremony for the University of Nevada School of Medicine. Please remain standing for the presentation of the colors by the University of Nevada, Reno, ROTC, and the playing of the national anthem. Thank you. Please be seated. I am Melissa Piasecki, the Executive Associate Dean of the University of Nevada School of Medicine, and I am honored to welcome all of our distinguished guests, faculty, staff, alumni, family, friends, and most importantly, the class of 2016 to this very special event the School of Medicine Academic Hooding Ceremony. All of you here gathered today have shared in the success of these students, and it is a great gift that you are here with us on this special day. This is a celebration not only of our students' achievements, but of the love, encouragement, and support that makes this day possible for our graduates. It is now my pleasure to invite Dr. Mark Johnson, President of the University of Nevada, Reno, to the podium. Good afternoon, and I too would like to welcome everyone here today, and especially the class of 2016 from the Uni University of Nevada School of Medicine. This is an exciting time for you all, and for the School of Medicine. And I cannot recall a time when the university, the School of Medicine, and our community have been in more alignment than, it is right, than they are right now. We share a very clear and compelling vision for the future of healthcare in Northern Nevada and our state. The school is transforming with new partners, 
and new programs. And today, we celebrate the closing of one chapter in your lives. Going forward, you will have many opportunities to heal, to provide counsel, and to make people better, and make the whole world better. I want to relate a story of one doctor I met last week. Ten days ago, I was in the northern part of Israel on the Golan Heights. I met a doctor who exemplified the oath which you are about to take. Dr. Michael Harari is head of the pediatrics department at Ziv Hospital in Safed, Israel. He's a soft-spoken and humble man, but he lives in a war-torn war part of the world. He's an Israeli. One of the greatest threats to Israel's survival is Syria, next door. But today, Syria's attention is focused on their own civil war within Syria. Dr. Harari related stories of many Syrian families who managed to get their wounded children from Syria to Ziv Hospital for treatments of wounds and illnesses. Dr. Harari didn't have any political enemies. He had young patients, and he cared for them. I was moved by this kind of dedication to his oath, and I challenge each of our new physicians to maintain that same kind of focused dedication to care. Best wishes on your journeys. Thank you, President Johnson. Now I would like to invite the Dean of the University of Nevada School of Medicine and Vice President of the Division of Health Sciences, Dr. Thomas Schwenk, to the podium. Mr. Piasecki, thank you. Welcome to all of you to this very solemn and very celebratory event. I'd like to begin uh, by recognizing uh, some special guests who are with us today. Uh, first, uh, Regent of the Nevada System of Higher Education, Kevin Melcher. You've already met uh, University of Nevada, Reno President, Dr. Mark Johnson. I acknowledge him again because of his extraordinary support for the medical school. I'll introduce our keynote speaker. You will hear more about him in a moment, uh, Dr. Howard Markell, who is the George Wants Distinguished Professor of the History of Medicine and a Professor of Pediatrics and Communicable Diseases and Director of the Center for the History of Medicine at the University of Michigan. <laughs> President of the uh, School of the Medicine Alumni Association, Dr. Helen Gray. And finally, I want to acknowledge our community partners, uh, many of whom are represented here, in, in particular leadership of the Sierra Nevada VA Health System and of Renown Health, uh, our more major partners in the community, and, and thank them for their uh, support. I want to welcome all of you, uh, parents, family members, spouses, friends of these students. You've been the source of motivation and support for these students for all these years, and you have brought them to this point, and, and I thank you for that. I want to recognize in particular, uh, to my right, your left, uh, an outstanding group of faculty members who have come to share in this special moment and who are responsible for the extraordinary education that these students have received. And I want to in particular comment on uh, the department chairs who are here with us today. Each of these department chairs has signed each of the diplomas uh, to be received by these uh, students, and that's a testimony to the commitment they have made and their faculty members have made to the excellent education that these uh, students have received. So thank you all for being here for this uh, special event. So this is the moment uh, that you have been working for for all of these years. All the preparation, all the applications, the admissions process, four hard years, everything that's gone into this is coming to fruition at this point. Each of you is about to become an alumnus of the University of Nevada School of Medicine, and I could be, not be more proud uh, to welcome you to this distinguished group of physicians. I have very clear memories, personally, of welcoming you on your first day, nearly four years ago now. Feels like just last week. 
I've had the pleasure with, with working with many of you over the past four years in the student outreach clinic, in class, on research projects, and in your family medicine rotation. And those experiences have been enormously satisfying. And they also remind me every day of the solemn obligation that we all at the School of Medicine have to contribute in every possible way to making you the best possible physician. Every moment of your medical school experience is a privilege that I think you should cherish. And you are now about to be accorded new privileges. The privilege to serve your patients, their families, your communities, and your profession and the privilege to be the source of expertise to cure disease, the source of, of comfort for those who are suffering, the source of hope for patients who are discouraged and desperate. And just at this moment of celebration, I'm going to remind you that this is just the beginning. And that there's a reason we call this commencement, the commencement of a lifelong commitment to your profession and a lifelong commitment to learning. We do not call this event a celebration, a ceremony to celebrate the end of exams. There's never an end to studying, never an end to exams, and the future exams are much harder. The future exams come in the form of patients and families who need your compassion and need your expertise. The future exams come in the form of communities who need your service and need your professional contributions. The future exams come in the form of a healthcare system undergoing profound change and in need of your guidance. Future exams come in the form of, of a future generation of physicians who see you and want to be like you. And future exams come in the form of a long career in which you want to be even smarter at the end than you are now at the beginning, more skilled, more expert, more wise, more compassionate. Defining feature of medicine is to never stop learning and to never stop growing. So I congratulate each of you for your special accomplishments and achievements, and I thank you for the many ways that you have made this class special and made the School of Medicine better. We are happy for your achievements, sad that you are leaving, and proud of you as new alumni of this School of Medicine. And we are committed to continue in our tradition of outstanding medical education so that you are always proud to say that you graduated from the University of Nevada School of Medicine. What I most hope for you is that your life as a physician is an, un un an unending source of fascination, of satisfaction, and rejuvenation as it has been for me for 41 years. Congratulations. It's now my pleasure uh, to welcome to the podium the president of the class of 2016, Jacob Anderson. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. To all our family, friends, and loved ones, and most importantly, to the class of 2016, I want to welcome you such, to such an exciting day for our class. I remember countless hours sitting in study rooms with some of my best friends here, fantasizing about being a fourth year med student and the concept of actually graduating. I'm still in disbelief that we're finally here. Before I delve into what it really means to be a member of our class of 2016, I just wanna take a brief moment to truly thank all of you, our families and friends in attendance. Without you, none of us would be here today, and we cannot thank you enough for your encouragement, love, and support throughout this difficult journey in our entire lives. Next, I'd also like to thank the, the administration uh, for all of your support, mentorship, and guidance throughout this scary process. There was never a time that I stopped by the Office of Medical Education that I wouldn't receive a fist bump from Leonard Walker, free food from Jody, or just general support and advice from anyone I ran into. I also want to thank the, the entire esteemed faculty, attendings, residents, and volunteer community physicians for your measurable contributions to our learning and development as, as physicians. The amount of time and effort each of you put into our education is the reason we succeed in medical school and why UNSOM continu continues to excel in the national residency match year after year. And finally, I'd also like to thank all of my classmates. It's really been a privilege to serve as your class president for the past four years, and I enjoyed every minute of it. Now on to the class of 2016. I could talk into detail about all the amazing accomplishments, both academic and personal, that the class of 2016 has reached together but instead I'll just highlight a few to keep the speech under an hour. 
At the time, after taking our step one board exams, uh, our class recorded the highest uh, average score in the history of our school. We were the first class to experience the newly integrated curriculum, and we're, we had some paramount people into forming it into the success that it is today. We have countless members and leaders of national organizations and research award winners. Um, our class has had enough babies during our four years here at UNSOM to fill up the entire newborn nursery at Renown. And by the time residency starts, we've had at least 12 new marriages since 2012 and three between class members. And most importantly, this class gives back to the community with thousands of combined hours of community service to our student outreach clinic and other community events. The class of 2016 is nothing less than a stellar group of people. I'm really honored to call each and every one of you my colleagues, and I look forward to the decades ahead as we lead the way for the future of medicine. I believe if you ask most of my classmates, at the beginning of medical school why we wanted to become physicians, most of us would have answered in some way or another that we wanted to help people. Some of us may have had a life-altering event that prompted us to turn towards medicine, and others may have been exposed to the life of a physician through a family member or a friend, or some may even just have had the desire to become a doctor their whole lives. Fortunately, at the time, most of us weren't aware of what it actually took to help people and make a difference as a young third or fourth year medical student. Most of us probably imagine sprinting through the ER like McDreamy, reaching our patient, grabbing some defib defibrillation pads, yelling clear, and then once our patient miraculously bounced back to life saying something like, they're not gone until I say they're gone. <laughs> and this may have been a true scenario for some of us, I'm thinking John Walter, <laughs> but, uh, but I can attest most of the time, school was just plain old tough. It was grinding, some days you wanna quit tough. It meant getting to the hospital at 4 a.m. just to make sure we pre-rounded on all the new patients so that we could not only be wrong about our proposed plan of treatment, <laughs> but also tired and hungry during all of our presentations while rounding. It meant foregoing, foregoing many social events with family or friends because we feared the distinct possibility of missing all of Dr. Sievert and Dr. Higginson's anatomy practical questions. As a student, we, start, we started at the bottom of a totem pole and have achieved and learned so much in the past four years. Although UNSOM has prepared us, all of us, for residency and the next steps of our eventual careers, being a medical student truly showed me how much I still don't know about medicine. I can't wait to be at the bottom of a new pole, totem pole next year. Most people on the outside think that when we graduate from medical school, we're ready to uh, diagnose any and all ailments. We can diagno diagnose the rash that Aunt Millie shows us at Thanksgiving, or we can give Grandpa Joe some adjustments to his three-page list of heart medications. And we can even raise our hands on the airplane when the pilot says, are there any physicians on board? And while we're a lot closer to being able to do those things, that's what makes medicine so special, is that we're never done learning. We'll continue to learn for the next three to seven years, Catapano, in residency, and then for the rest of our careers after that. Even though we started at the bottom, we knew there was excitement, happiness, success, and passion at the end of the tunnel. We knew one day we'd be able to truly help people and share our compassion and love for the human race. I'm sure many of us are really afraid and unsure of what the future will hold up for us as physicians. I'm, I'm not scared to admit that I'm terrified for my first day or week or month as an intern, but I do know that we've been pre prepared for these days thanks to all the wonderful people sitting here today. In closing, I often found myself throughout the past four years wishing that I had a fast forward button in medical school. We all likely experienced times when we wanted to skip through an exam or, or a, rota a rotation or even a year. Now that we've come through all of the challenges, it is time for us to take a step back and appreciate how far we have come and how much work we put in to get here. As a hilarious and philosophical television physician, John Dorian from the TV show Scrubs once put it, I usually don't like thinking about the future. I mean, let's face it, you can't predict what's gonna happen. But sometimes, the thing you didn't expect is what you really wanted after all. And maybe the best thing to do is just stop trying to figure out where you're going and just enjoy where you're at. Thank you all. Thank you, Jacob. Now I would like to introduce our keynote speaker. It is indeed an honor to introduce and welcome Dr. Howard Markell. Dr. Markell, who has both an MD and a PhD, is a medical historian whose scholarly achievements have led to many distinguished grants, awards, and honors. 
His remarkable list of recognitions includes election to the National Academy of Medicine, a Guggenheim Foundation Fellowship, and at the University of Michigan, he is the George E. Wentz Distinguished Professor of the History of Medicine and the Director of the Center for the History of Medicine. He is also a Professor of Pediatrics, Psychiatry, Public Health, History, and English Literature. As you might note from this long list of academic appointments ranging from medicine to literature and beyond, Dr. Markell is a remarkable scholar. His unique perspective joins together not just the history of medicine, but how medicine shapes our history and serves society. Dr. Markell's contributions transcend academia and include consultation to the CDC on pandemic preparedness and the 2015 Ken Burns documentary, The Emperor of Maladies. We are very honored to have Dr. Markell as our 2016 Hooding Speaker. He will be speaking today about those magical moments when the patient makes the doctor feel better. Please welcome Dr. Markell to the podium. Well, thank you for that. Dean Schwenk, faculty, honored guests, family members, loved ones, and of course the class of 2016. First, let me confess that I've long wondered what it would be like to deliver a commencement address to a group of eager, eager young doctors on graduation day. Others may dream of hitting a home run during the World Series or perhaps giving a State of the Union address to the Congress. But for me, a scholar and a professor who has spent most of his life on a university campus and a medical school, my number one fantasy has always been a proud walk in cap and gown accompanied by a grand musical procession, a podium of my own, and the chance to pom pompously pontificate as you all squirm, waiting for the moment that you can come up here, grab your diplomas, and move on to the partying portion of the festivities. That said, and with the promise that I will try to be brief, it's an especially great honor to be here this afternoon. It's hard to believe that it was 30 years ago in 1986, almost to the day, when I was one of you, the soon-to-be doctor of medicine, about to begin my internship, scared out of my wits. My talk today will be divided into three parts. First, I'd like to tell you a little bit about my improbable career and hopefully offer some advice as you embark upon yours. Two, then because I tell stories for a living, I will tell you a story about a patient who changed my life. And third, I will conclude this address with some rousing words to encourage you all as you leave these hallowed halls and march into the next exciting phase of your medical career. So part one, who am I? You know, a team of psychiatrists in Vienna struggle to answer that question. Uh, I will try briefly. As you may have gathered, I'm a medical historian and a pediatrician, and as a physician, I've always found my literary inquiries to be especially helpful in figuring out a great many medical problems. And as a writer, historian, and journalist, my medical education has enabled me a better, if still imperfect, understanding and explanation of the human condition, which is, after all, the purview of both physicians and authors. After graduating from medical school at Michigan and thence to training as a pediatrician and a historian of medicine at Johns Hopkins, I was called back to the Ann Arbor to join the faculty at Michigan, and I have been there ever since. Ironically, that was precisely my career goal when I sat where you are sitting today, which reminds me of the first pearl of wisdom I would like to offer. Be very careful what you wish for. In retrospect, it was a, a youthful, if not outright naive, belief that I could become a doctor who studied medical history let alone actually making a living at it, at it. My father, who was a successful businessman and a practical man at that, best described the situation. Upon completing my residency training in pediatrics, I informed him that instead of taking an offer to join a lucrative private practice on New York City's Park Avenue, 
I was going to go get a PhD in the history of medicine. Well, Dad shook his head and he warily replied, Howard, you find new ways to make less money every year. <laughs> Similarly, on the last day of my residency, a prominent immunologist came up to the floor I was supervising. He was arrogant, self-assured, and confident that he would someday win the Nobel Prize, uh, an achievement he has still not been accorded, by the way. As I scribbled my last clinical notes, the doctor asked me, what was I going to do the following morning? And I proudly told him of my graduate school plans. And he looked at me incredulously as if I had just told him I planned on flying to Jupiter on a flexible flyer sled. He said to me, Howard, why do you want to study medical history when you can make it? That ticked me off. And I didn't have an answer, and I stewed about it for several weeks. As a historian, I'm compelled to tell you the truth that I did come up with a snappy answer, but it was about two weeks later while I was shaving in the mirror, and I'm happy to report that answer to you. Oh, yeah? Well, I'm going to write the history of medicine, and guess what? You're not going to be in it. <laughs> We're a very vindictive bunch, us historians. In the years since, I hope I have been able to prove a large number of detractors wrong by creating a body of work demonstrating that history does indeed matter, especially in a forward-thinking profession as medicine, and that we ignore it at our own peril. If there is a secret to the success I've enjoyed, I'd like to share that interpretation with you. Long before I could get publishers to publish my books, or newspapers, or radio shows to print my editorials or interview me, Long before the CDC or the White House asked me to weigh in on pandemic preparedness, even longer before I knew precisely how I would do what I now do daily, I knew I had to listen to myself rather than to others and to somehow find something I love, something I could pursue faithfully for a long period of time with every ounce of energy I possessed. Luckily, I discovered my quarry and it worked I brought as much excitement and joy to my work this morning. I'm still on Eastern time, so I got up at 5.30 your time. Uh, but I brought as much enjoyment to my work this morning as I did 30 years ago. And so if I can give you any career advice, it's simply this. Pursue the dreams that most stimulate and engage you, no matter how silly they may seem to others. Grab them, hang on to them for dear life, but also be humble enough to realize that dreams and talent will only get you so far. Hard work will get you even farther. And now for part two, a story about a patient who changed my life and the way I think about the world. Doctors aren't supposed to have favorite patients, but here's a poorly kept secret. We do. Mine was a 57-year-old man named Joe who died after a 15-year battle against AIDS. Although I hadn't been Joe's physician for several years since I moved away from the city where he lived, we kept in close contact. One day I received a letter from his longtime partner, John, telling me that Joe had died from the disease that has shaped our era as starkly as bubonic plague framed the Renaissance. He was, as John put it, brave to his last breath. In the early years of the AIDS epidemic, few physicians were interested in treating HIV-positive patients and while I was a pediatrician, I had a great deal of experience in treating sexually transmitted diseases in adolescence. Thus, I was cajoled into volunteering by a clinic director of our AIDS clinic for adults, and she bluntly said, we need you. Little did she know how much I needed them. Indeed, that AIDS clinic, one that I attended for over three years, was perhaps the most gratifying clinical and perhaps personal experiences of my career. Now, Joe earned his living as a professional psychic, but he was no charlatan or confidence man. As I was to learn, he was a remarkably accurate soothsayer. During our long relationship, his predictions about my life came true at least nine times out of 10. A skeptic by nature and refined by years of medical training, it took me several visits to warm to Joe's special abilities. But as this elfin, fast-talking, flamboyant man seemed to accomplish with almost everyone he met, Joe soon won me over 
and I became one of his most ardent admirers. The rest of the AIDS clinic staff always knew when Joe was in my exam room because they could hear me laugh with glee as Joe predicted my future and divined my past. We first met 25 years ago. It was a bleak January evening, and Joe was newly released from the hospital. He was recuperating from a severe bout of herpes that attacked the nerves of his face and threatened to invade his brain. His immune system was practically non-existent. When Joe walked into the clinic room with the aid of a cane, the hundreds of weeping blisters that trailed the paths of his facial nerves initially repelled me. Herpes, as any viral veteran will quickly offer, hurts like hell. Yet Joe was jovial and upbeat throughout our visit, an outlook I was to learn framed his entire worldview. Now at this point in medical history, doctors had relatively little to offer patients like Joe with full-blown AIDS, and I recall how I predicted to myself that evening that Joe was not likely to live to see Easter. After my exam, Joe informed me about his psychic powers, or as he always referred to him, my gift. He said, I am the 11th child of the 11th daughter in an old Sicilian family, and such people are always blessed with the gift to foresee the future and ascertain the past of anyone he meets. Well, my disbelief must have radiated out of my eyes. I thank Joe for sharing that bit of family history with me and adopted the body language doctors often assume to signal that the visit is about to reach its end. Sensing my doubt, Joe sprang into action and began telling me details about my childhood with eerie precision. A consummate showman, Joe saved the best for last. He said, your mother had a very difficult pregnancy with you. She began bleeding three months into it and was confined for the rest of her pregnancy to strict bed rest. Well, his knowledge of this arcane fact of my personal history floored me, but my memory of the family lore placed the bed rest edict at four months. That was until later that evening when I called my mother, who confirmed exactly what Joe had noted only a few hours earlier. Across the span of a decade, Joe lived a relatively disease-free life, albeit one occasionally interrupted by serious challenges of diabetes, neuropathies, and other unpredictable recrudescences of HIV. He continued his psychic practice. He cooked enormously ambitious meals for his friends every week. And at least once a month, he hit the casinos of Atlantic City, and when he won big, he parlayed those chips into trips to Las Vegas. Well before the advent of effective anti-HIV medication regimens, Joe's health significantly improved, and I came to believe that his stunning determination would outwit, outwit the crafty human immunodeficiency virus. Joe offered his own explanation. He said, I can't die of AIDS. I, I have too many people to meet and too many to share my gift with. After I moved from Baltimore to Ann Arbor and our formal doctor-patient relationship ended, I often thought of Joe and I discussed his story with my students. And when I read the brief letter from his partner, John, informing me of Joe's death, my immediate reaction was a deep-rooted and painful sorrow. Yet such feelings only obscured Joe's remarkable legacy. And instead, I reversed course and chose to recall how everyone at the AIDS clinic, patients, physicians, nurses, all looked forward to Joe's visits. He was a man who changed the way we understood the adversity of illness and the importance of believing in things that don't always seem logical or scientific. Hope and faith are subjects rarely covered in medical schools, perhaps because professors like me are so ill-equipped to teach them. These were not difficult concepts for Joe. His joyous approach to life, his incredible ability to brighten the spirits of others stricken with HIV were as therapeutic as anything his doctors had to offer. Perhaps physicians aren't supposed to have favorite patients. I am so grateful that I did. And now for the rousing words of conclusion. I want to leave you with a line written by one of my favorite authors, Charles Dickens. It is the opening line of his masterpiece, David Copperfield. And the character David Copperfield is tentatively beginning his own memoir with the line, whether or not 
I shall turn out to be the hero of my own life, or whether that station will be held by somebody else, these pages must show. These pages must show. Well, you don't have to be an English major to figure out the symbolism of that one. Dickens is speaking to all of us. And now it's your turn. How are you going to apply the lessons you learned at the University of Nevada? And because the practice of medicine and the knowledge that underpins it is so dynamic, how will you adapt and grow in your profession? How will you fulfill your social contract with the communities you serve? As you construct your narratives each page, each day, you must ask yourself, am I really the hero of my own life? This lofty aspiration is not promised to any of us. You have to work for it. And you must be prepared to respond and adapt to the curveballs life invariably throws at us. Every day, you will see patients who took risks with their health and now need your help. But there are also risks not taken that can be just as life-threatening or at least soul-squelching. Such risks may be well worth taking. They might even make you the hero of your life. Now, I had a conclusion, but as I was flying here yesterday from Detroit to Reno, I was sitting next to a cowboy. He was actually a cow man, but I guess you'd call him a cowboy. And he was coming to Nevada to buy a horse. And he asked me what I was coming to Nevada for, and I told him I was coming here to speak to you all. He said, I've got a great line to end your speech. Now, as an author, I hear that all the time, and it, it rarely pays off, but I, I'd like to share this one with you. I even wrote it on a sticky tab on my notes. I can't do his drawl, but I'll try. If you ever see a turtle sitting on a fence post, remember, that turtle didn't get up there by himself. That takes some thought. You gotta think about it. And that's a wonderful segue to acknowledge your families, your parents, your spouses, your loved ones, your friends, your teachers, all of who helped you where you are today. I wish you the best of success in your future endeavors. And as one of many baby booming Americans who are getting older, creakier, and crankier by the second, let me tell you, we need you. Now go out there and save some lives, and I wish you my heartiest congratulations. Dr. Markell, thank you so much. I would now like to introduce the following faculty members who will assist in the presenting of Hoods to our graduates. Dr. Timothy Baker, Associate Dean for Medical Education, and Dr. Cherie Singer, Associate Dean for Admissions and Student Affairs. And I would like to ask the following individuals to proceed to the right side of our stage, President Mark Johnson, Dean Thomas Schwenk, and Dr. Helen Gray, graduate of the class of 2008 and president of the University of Nevada School of Medicine Alumni Association. Graduates and Hooders, please stand and come forward as I call your names. Please remember to pause after you are hooded for a photograph. The University of Nevada School of Medicine is proud to have three alumni who are hooding our graduates today. Erica Terry Allred, hooded by Ryan Christopher Martinez. Jacob P. Anderson, hooded by Yvette Ray Anderson.
Yvette Ray Anderson, hooded by Jacob P. Anderson. <laughs> Bradley Bossy, hooded by Dr. Jennifer Hollander. <laughs> Joshua Catapano, hooded by Dr. Michael. Catapano. <laughs> Alexander Chang, hooded by Damoth, excuse me, Dr. Timothy Baker. University of Nevada School of Medicine, class of 2004. <laughs> Sean Robin Como, hooded by Ellen Como. Sean Michael Davis, hooded by Hillary Davis. <laughs> Garrett Max Dunford, hooded by Bree Bitten. <laughs> Seth Ida Miller, hooded by Dr. Carolyn Reese. Gregory Michael Evangelatos, hooded by Gregory G. Evangelatos. <laughs> Brittany Galusha, hooded by Jason Galusha. Paulo Saldi Garcia, hooded by Des Garcia. Christopher Goodwill, hooded by Tanya Goodwill. Jared Hayden Grifford, hooded by Annette. 
Grifford. Jeffrey Adam Grudzinski, hooded by Margaret Grudzinski. Sarah Jordan Hand, hooded by Patricia Hand. Brett Michael Hansen, hooded by Mika Hansen. Tyler Paul Heron, hooded by Dr. Paul Valentine Heron. <laughs> Michael J. Helen, hooded by Laura Helen. Anna Marie Hofstetter, hooded by Kenny McDaniel. <laughs> Daniel Aaron Ignacic, hooded by Deborah Ann Ignacic. John Kim, hooded by Dr. David Kim. <laughs> Michael Joseph Kimes, hooded by Tara Nicole Kimes. <laughs> Matthew Jeffrey Klippenstein hooded by Dr. Michael Gerard Glenn. <laughs> Charles Lawrence, hooded by Andrew Lawrence.
Gordon Lee, hooded by Stephen Lee. Cameron McAdams, hooded by Allie McAdams. <laughs> Joshua Cameron McDavid, Hooded by Diane McDavid. Norlin Alfonso Maltez, hooded by Mariella Maltez. Diane A. Marr, Hooded by Dr. David Marr. <laughs> Stephanie Martinez, hooded by Dr. Louis A. Martinez. Sarah Jane McDaniels, hooded by Michael McDaniels. Sean Timothy McGee, hooded by Dr. Carrie Krogan, University of Nevada School of Medicine, class of 1999. Jennifer Elizabeth Minor, hooded by Sean Rochelle Minor. <laughs> Natasha Monga, hooded by Varun K. Munga. <laughs> Siobhan Sherelle Moore, hooded by Sherla Dawkins Stephens. Thank <laughs> you. 
Lindsay Allison Murphy, hooded by Ralph Murphy. Kathleen Claire Murray, hooded by Nancy Adrian. Justin David Norvell, hooded by Lindsay Norvell. <laughs> Stephen R. Owens, hooded by Kimberly Quinn. Caroline Elise Perez, hooded by John Carr. Christine Marie Raps, hooded by David Allen Nelson. Evan Raps, hooded by Dr. Charles Raps. <laughs> Christopher Vernon Robertson, hooded by Brooke Robertson. <laughs> Javier Alexander Rodriguez, hooded by Emma Rodriguez. <laughs> Brianna Rook hooded by Dr. Bridget Brew. <laughs> 
Alexander David Shaft, hooded by Stanley Shaft. Richard Aaron Shaheen, hooded by Eric Shaheen. <laughs> James Hugh Stockton, hooded by Jin Stockton. Russell Tyler Stodmeister, hooded by Laura Stodmeister. Kabir Suri, hooded by Aaron Suri. Jeffrey Blaine Serena, hooded by Nancy Serena. John Sims hooded by Annie Sims. Mark Anthony Taylor II, hooded by Emily Taylor. Karen Ann Thiel, hooded by Mr. Edward Neal Johnson. Cameron Milne Thompson, hooded by Kip Thompson. Anna Maria Torres, hooded by Dr. Wilfredo Antonio Torres, University of Nevada School of Medicine, class of 2010. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Spencer Van Dyke, hooded by the Honorable Christopher Van Dyke. John Robert Walter, hooded by Rochelle Walter. <laughs> Caleb Robert Wartgo, hooded by Amanda Wartgo. Alexandra Nicole Watson, hooded by Kelly Jean Watson. Kelby John Wilson, hooded by Liza Wilson. <laughs> Zechariah Wilson, hooded by Sherry Michelle Wilson. <laughs> Brian Snyder Wong, Hooded by Dr. Jeffrey Wong. I would now like to call up on the stage Lieutenant Colonel, excuse me, Lieutenant Colonel Brian Ricks, United States Air Force, and class of University of Nevada School of Medicine, class of 1997, and Lieutenant Colonel J. Ivan Lopez, Medical Corps, United States Army Reserve, Professor and Chair, Department of Neurology, and Director, renowned Institute for Neurosciences. They will perform the officer commissioning of two of our graduating students, Sean Timothy McGee and Richard Aaron Shaheen. Sean and Richard, please approach the center stage for your commissioning.
raise your right hand. I state your full name. I, Sean Timothy McGee. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I support and defend. That I support and defend. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully. That I will well and faithfully. Discharge the duties. Discharge the duties. Of the office to which I'm about to enter. Of the office for which I'm about to enter. So help me God. So help me God. Raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, your name? I, Richard Sheehan. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support and defend. That I will support and defend. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear truth, faith, and allegiance to the same. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully. And I will faithfully. Discharge the duties. Discharge the duties. Of the office to which I am about to enter. Of the office of which I'm about to enter. So help me God. So help me God. I would like to ask all of our graduating students, the physicians on stage and in the audience, to reaffirm their commitment to the medical profession and join the members of the class of 2016 in reciting the physician's oath. The oath is on page 44 of the program book. Dr. Helen Gray will lead the recitation of the physician's oath. Graduates and physicians, please stand. Good afternoon, everyone. I am so glad to be representing Unsum's Alumni Association as this new class will be stepping over and joining us here. As a reminder, our mission for the Alumni Association is to exist to build and foster a community to support lifelong learning, service, and connection to the School of Medicine for the benefits of our students and our alumni. For those who preceded you and those who will follow, we ask you to continue our traditions of compassion and excellence. So together, we will recite the physician's oath. I solemnly pledge to consecrate my life to the service of humanity. I will give to my teachers the respect and gratitude that is their due. I will practice my profession with conscience and dignity. The health of my patient will be my first consideration. I will respect the secrets that are confided in me even after the patient has died. I will maintain by all the means in my power the honor and the noble traditions of the medical profession. My colleagues will be my sisters and brothers. I will not permit considerations of age, disease, or disability, creed, ethnic origin, gender, nationality, political affiliation, race, sexual orientation, social standing, or any other factor to intervene between my duty and my patient. I will maintain the utmost respect for human life. 
I will not use my medical knowledge to violate human rights and civil liberties, even under threat. I make these promises solemnly, freely, and upon my honor. Congratulations, class of 2016. Thank you, Dr. Gray. Please be seated. I would now like to ask President Johnson to the podium to confer the Doctor of Medicine degree upon the University of Nevada School of Medicine class of 2016. Would all the candidates rise one more time? <laughs> By virtue of the laws of the state of Nevada, and the authority invested in me by the Board of Regents for the Nevada System of Higher Education, I confer upon you the Doctor of Medicine degrees that you have earned with all of the rights, privileges, and obligations belonging thereto. Congratulations. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. I would like to take a moment to thank the many people who have made this hooding ceremony a success. Thank you, Dean Schwenk, for your leadership of our great school. Thank you to the Great Basin Bass Ensemble who have provided today's lovely music. Thank you to the University of Nevada, Reno, ROTC, for the presentation of the flags. Thank you to the staff of Lawler Event Center and to our Grand Marshal and Protocol Expert, Dr. Josh Baker, Associate Professor of Pharmacology and Director of the Nevada INBRE. Finally, and most of all, thank you to the School of Medicine faculty, and thank you to the staff of the Admissions and Student Affairs Office and the Office of Academic Affairs. Thank all of you for your dedication to these students and support of this special event. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being a part of today's academic hooding ceremony. To the class of 2016, Thank you for sharing your journey with us. Please rise and join me in celebrating the University of Nevada School of Medicine graduating class of 2016 as they recess.